The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. I'm hoping to rent an apartment from September when I begin here, and I'd really like some advice on where to rent and how to rent a place. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hi. Hello. How can we help you? Is this the Office of Institutional Real Estate? Yes, sir. My name's Alice Baum and I'm a University Housing Supervisor. Oh, good. I wonder if you could help me. I'll certainly try, sir. I'm hoping to rent an apartment from September when I begin here, and I'd really like some advice on where to rent and how to rent a place. Advice on renting in Manhattan. We've got plenty of advice about that. The first thing to think about are the prices. New York is an expensive place to live, and Manhattan is the most expensive place in New York. Everyone wants to be here. In most areas of Manhattan, you'll have great difficulty finding a studio apartment for less than thirteen to $1,400 per month. But there are areas just outside Manhattan, within a 30 to 40 minute commute, where you can find a decent studio apartment to rent for $850 to $1,000 per month. That's a big difference. But then there are travel costs on top of that. Yes, there are. If you're prepared to make compromises in your choice of accommodation, perhaps you can find an apartment you like and can afford. Monthly rents also depend on two other factors, apartment size and then amenities. Can you tell me a bit more about that? Basically, bigger flats get higher rents, so if you can live without a lot of space, it's much cheaper. And if you're willing to take a flat which has street noise or doesn't have much natural light, then you may save some more money. I see. However, you could go the other way and get a bigger flat and share it with another student. You can cut costs by sharing a large bedroom. To find a roommate, check the listings for apartment shares in the housing registry. Share a flat? I hadn't given that idea much thought. Lots of our students do that. What about amenities? Can you explain that a bit more? You need to decide what facilities you really would like and what you can do without. For example, do you want a doorman? Would you like an elevator? These kinds of things put the prices up. I don't think I need a doorman. Is there anything else I should know? Yes. Remember, the housing market is very competitive, especially for affordable apartments. You need to be prepared to make decisions quickly and be flexible with your plans. Don't start your search earlier than four weeks before you want to move in, because tenants only need to give landlords 30 days notice of their departure. Okay. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. And make apartment hunting your life for two or three weeks. That should be enough time to get familiar with the market and find what you're looking for. What's the best way of finding a place? There are really only two ways. You do it yourself or you get someone else to do it for you. That sounds interesting. How do I do that? There are property brokers who will find a place for you. They can guide you to the property of your choice and help you with the paperwork. Wow, that sounds great. But they do charge you a commission fee. In Manhattan, expect to pay between 12 and 15 percent of the year's rent. That means if your rent is $1,000 a month, the broker's fee works out to $1,800. Oh, maybe not a broker then. And what's the other option again? Do the legwork yourself. Look in the classified ads, call landlord companies, and do online searches. Check out our website first. You mentioned paperwork. Could you tell me something about that? 
Sure. To rent an apartment, you may be asked to complete an application by your prospective landlord. You may also be asked to pay between fifty and two hundred dollars for credit reports. Landlords want to see evidence of steady income and good credit. I see. Because you're a full-time student, most landlords will require a guarantor, someone to guarantee you will pay the rent on time. And when the landlord approves your apartment application, be prepared to pay the first month's rent and the deposit when you sign the lease. That's a lot to think about, and it sounds like a lot of hard work. Thank you very much for the advice. You're very welcome, and good luck. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Hello, welcome to the university. Let me introduce myself. My name's Helen Brown. I'm the International Office Administrator and I'm responsible for looking after students here on scholarships, in particular Chevening Scholars. Perhaps you could introduce yourselves to me. Hi, I'm Ansgar from Gras in southern Austria. And my name is Magali. I'm from a town near Montpellier, France. It's a pleasure to meet you. Pleased to meet you too. Nice to meet you. So, let's get started. I'm going to tell you about the schedule for today. Today is your orientation day at the university, and it's going to begin in half an hour at ten o'clock with a speech from the Vice-Chancellor welcoming you to the university. That's very nice. Where is it? It's in the main hall on floor three. OK, but how do we get there? From here, the international office, go down the corridor, past the lecture theatre and student common room. Then you'll be at the main entrance and you'll see the lift to your left. Take the lift to floor three and the main hall entrance is after the buffet. OK, floor three after the buffet. I can always find my way to food. So we'll be able to find the main hall, no problem. So after the Vice-Chancellor greets the new students, then 30 minutes later, the Mayor will welcome you to the city. Together it should be about an hour, so it's not too much of a drag. And what happens then? After that, you'll have a meeting with a representative of the British Council, and she will brief you on life in Britain and what your sponsor expects, and of course doesn't expect from you. It will be nice to meet them. Is that in the main hall too? No, but it is on floor three again. With your back to the main hall, go down the corridor past the labs. Sorry? The laboratories, on your right, and the computer cluster rooms on your left, and at the end of the corridor are seminar rooms one and two. Your meeting is in seminar room two. Did you mention what time that is? No, I didn't. It's at 11.15, and it should last about half an hour. You'll meet her a number of times during your studies, so it's important to go to that meeting. OK. I'll make sure Magali is on time. Ansgar, I'm always on time. Very well. Now for the final part of the morning and lunch, you'll be with your department. We're both doing biomedicine. Oh, that's interesting. But we're not sure how to get to our department. Well, you don't need to go very far from seminar room two. The laboratories and seminar rooms all belong to your department. So basically, you need to turn left out of seminar room two and go past the next two teaching rooms. Your departmental office is on the left. Will someone be there to meet us? Oh, but of course. At 12 o'clock, the course administrator will meet you at the departmental office and introduce you to members of staff and the head of department, Professor He knew. He knew? How do you spell that? H-E-A-N-U-E. 
He will tell you about the department in your course, the coursework and academic life in Britain. Have you both got reading lists? Yes, I have. I'm afraid I haven't. You can get one at that meeting. Then finally, as it's your first day, you'll have lunch with the department staff in the refectory from one to two. Oh, that's really nice. Great. There's just one more thing. In the afternoon, you have the chance to meet other international students in the main hall again, and you can ask them about their time at the university. That's from two thirty onwards. I'm looking forward to that. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions seventeen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions seventeen to twenty. So you're thinking of opening a bank account with us? That's right. And you are an international student at the university? Yes, I am. And how did you hear about us? From student services. They gave me a list of banks near the university, and I chose this one because you have a branch near campus and a student advisor at the bank. Yes, I'm part of the student advice team. There are three of us here. Right now, I'll go over the services we offer to international students, and then we can go through a few details before we set up your account. Okay. We can offer you a current or check account and a savings account. Do you pay interest on the current account? We do, but not very much. About one point five percent. You get a much better interest rate on the savings account, around four percent. We also give you a free overdraft facility. I'm sorry. If you run out of money, we allow you to spend more money than you have in your account. That's the overdraft, but you can only take out up to one hundred pounds. If you need more than one hundred pounds, then you must tell us before you take any more money out. I see. Now, once your current account is open, then you can set up direct debits for any regular payments you need to make. Could you tell me how that works? Well, for instance, let's take your mobile phone. You have to pay a certain amount every month for it. Yes. So you can tell us to pay that amount each month, and we'll do it automatically for you. I see. As soon as your account is open, we will send you a debit card, which you must sign immediately and keep in a safe place. Then a day or two later, we'll send you a personal identification number. A PIN number. Yes, and you must keep the number secret. You can change it if you like. When you use it for the first time, but if you change it, you must remember the number. If you forget or lose the number, then we have to send you out a new card and a number for security reasons. Okay. The next thing you could do is open a savings account. If you know you have to save a certain amount of money to pay your accommodation or course fees, we can open a savings account for you to put aside some money each week or month. How can I do that? You can manage your accounts in one of four ways. You can come into the bank here on the university campus and tell us what you would like to do, or you can call us on zero eight four five seven double o four double o four and instruct us what to do over the phone. That's twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. Alternatively, you can manage your account over the internet. I see. You have to go online and register at our website at www dot hsbc dot co. dot uk slash online hyphen banking before you can use the service. Finally, if you have a digital TV, you can use TV banking by pressing interactive on your digital TV remote control. Oh really? I don't have a digital TV, unfortunately, but I can do the first three things. Now, do you have any insurance? What's that? For example, if you lose something or one of your possessions is stolen, we will cover the cost of it. How much does that cost? It's twenty-four pounds a year, so it really is worth thinking about. I don't need to think about that. I'll take out insurance. I'll arrange that for you as soon as your account is open. Now, would you like to go ahead and open an account with us?
That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two business studies students, Evelyn and Mark, preparing for a seminar presentation. Before you hear the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Well, I think the marketing of food would be a good topic. I read a very interesting article the other day about the Canadian food market. Hmm. I suppose everybody's interested in food, even if it's trying not to eat. Why Canada? I know that's where you come from, but isn't it just all North America, really? No. That's why I thought this article was interesting. Although lots of U.S. companies are well established in Canada, and vice versa, there are still subtle differences between the two markets. It says here, the Canadian market is definitely not a northern clone of the U.S. I like that. And it says that if you understand these differences, it can have a big impact on successful food marketing. So I know that Canada has a big French-speaking population in Quebec, is this what they're referring to? Not only French and English speakers, there are many different ethnic groups in Canada. It's really quite multicultural. For example, Toronto has large Asian and Italian populations, and Vancouver's got a large Asian population too. And, because Canada's population is small, these groups make quite an impact introducing new styles of cooking. So, you can see lots of unfamiliar vegetables and things in the markets, and new restaurants are opening every day. It's great if you love trying out new foods, as many people do. Which kinds of food are becoming popular? Well, some Asian food, I'd say, has been popular for quite a while, like Chinese. But now, Southeast Asian restaurants are becoming very fashionable. Then, there's Mediterranean, of course such as Greek, Italian, and so on. But Caribbean and Mexican food is really taking off among young people these days. So are the supermarkets starting to stock the ingredients that are needed to prepare these foods at home? You know, all those unusual condiments and sauces. Yes, that's right. It's quite interesting going to the supermarket, isn't it? And noticing how they're introducing sections for foods of different nationalities. You can buy quite exotic products locally these days. The article mentioned that 80% of the Canadian retail market is controlled by eight major national supermarket chains, so that when they introduce changes, they can happen quite rapidly. OK. Well, how are we going to organise this seminar then? I made some notes on the trends in the Canadian market about changing tastes and also patterns for where food is consumed. I thought maybe we could summarize it into a chart or table and maybe use the overhead projector to present it. Good idea. Maybe I could have a look for similar trends and tastes in Australia and the UK for comparison. Let's have a look at what you found. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now, as the conversation continues,
Answer questions 26 to 30. The most significant trend, it seemed to me, was that Canadians are definitely interested in healthy food. For example, did you know that salads are the third most commonly eaten food in Canadian restaurants? Really? What about organic food then? Is that becoming more popular? Yes, it's definitely moving into the mainstream compared to a few years ago. And a recent survey showed that four out of five shoppers said that they check the fat and nutritional information on the packet when they're deciding what to buy. What other trends did you find out? There's one change I noticed straight away when I was home last year in the meat department. You know, here the meat packaging says rump steak or four-quarter chops and so on. Well, they discovered that most consumers these days didn't know what to do with these roasts and rounds and ribs. So the government approved a new naming system for cuts of meat, which is related to the required cooking technique. What a good idea. I've never really understood the difference between sirloin, rump, round and all those names. So how many new categories are there? Eight. There are three kinds of steak, for grilling, for marinating and for simmering. And then there's what they call quick serve beef, for stir fries I suppose. And premium oven roast, oven roast, pot roast and stewing beef. It's a great idea, isn't it? I hope it catches on here. I agree. Any other trends that you thought were significant? Well, what's really interesting is what the article called mobile meals. In other words, more and more Canadians are eating meals away from home, but not just eating more junk food. They're projecting a 40% increase in snack food sales over the next three years, and the growth is coming from healthy snacks. You know, the ones that have less cholesterol and fat, such as muesli bars, health food bars, and those types of products. Apparently, in the food marketing jargon, they're called nutritious portable foods, which means healthy snacks. The other major trend is that young people are doing more of the food shopping these days, so marketing has to be aimed more at them, as well as more conventionally at the mother. Thanks, Evelyn. I think we'll have an interesting discussion about these trends and the comparisons with other English-speaking countries. I'll see if I can get some information about them to compare with yours and meet you on Friday to put it together. See you then. Bye. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a wildlife expert giving a talk to a group of bird lovers in the UK about a species called the tawny owl. Before you listen, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. Good evening, everyone. You're all likely to be familiar with pictures of the tawny owl because of all the owl species in the UK, it's actually the most common one. But the chances are that you're more likely to have heard one than actually seen one, as it's also strongly nocturnal. 
This means that it normally ventures out at night. So, what kind of habitat does the tawny owl prefer? Well, a survey carried out in the 1980s confirmed that this owl is most likely to be found in woodland. If you look at a map of tawny owl distribution across Britain, you'll only see gaps in the treeless marshy areas of eastern England and in some of the more upland parts of northwest Scotland. However, you can sometimes find populations of tawny owls in urban areas too, either in parks or in large gardens. The tawny owl shows some obvious adaptations to its natural habitat. For example, both its wings and its tail are short, which helps it to manoeuvre through the trees. Also, the bird's plumage is a mixture of brown and grey, and this provides suitable camouflage for when the owl perches up against a tree trunk. Then there are its large eyes. The tawny owl's visual capacities are considerably better than those of humans, and although it can't see in complete darkness, it's sufficiently well equipped to be able to navigate its way around woodland on all but the most overcast nights. Another factor that contributes to the tawny owl's success as a hunter is its excellent memory of the layout of different areas. If you combine this ability with the owl's strongly territorial and sedentary nature, most populations of tawny owl are sit-and-wait predators, you realise that it has a good opportunity to predict where prey might be found. Finally, as well as having large eyes, the owl's sense of hearing is excellent, and this helps it to locate potential prey as it sits on its perch. Turning now to the tawny owl's diet, woodland tawny owls feed mainly on mammals, especially small ones, such as wood mice and bank voles. But they'll also take things like frogs or bats or even fish if they happen to be available. In urbanised landscapes, the owls seem to prey more on birds. So there are some differences there. Let's just look briefly now at survival rates in the tawny owl. Young tawny owls face a difficult time once they leave home, and two out of every three are likely to die within their first year. So, with such high mortality levels, it's a good job that established breeding pairs can produce young over a number of seasons and maximise their chances of passing their genes on to the next generation of owls. I've already mentioned the sedentary nature of the tawny owl, but it's not just adult tawny owls that are sedentary in their habits. Young birds, dispersing away from where they were born, rarely move far. The average distance is just four kilometres. There also appears to be some reluctance to cross large bodies of water. The owl is absent from many of the islands around our shores, with only occasional sightings in Ireland and the Isle of Wight off the south coast of England. Right, well, now I'll show you some photographs that have been taken in one or two of the... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.